think I'm so crazy, but we're just going green. And a very good afternoon, Phuket. Nick Anthony here on Going Green, show number 72. It's Saturday the 4th of May, and the time is 3.07. I'm in the studio with Peter Harris. Good afternoon, Nick, and good afternoon to all my friends and family in Australia, Nick. Fantastic, mate. Welcome to the show today, and thanks for joining us over here in Phuket Town. Lovely to see you, Peter. You've been busy since last time you were on the show. Well, I've been very busy, Nick, but unfortunately, so have the mosquitoes in town. They've been far busier than me this year than any year in the past, according to the records. There is some issues, some big issues that Phuket's having to deal with, and indeed, I understand the government is doing something about it. Well, Nick, I want to tell you what these mosquitoes are doing. Do you know what? They buzz around and they start landing where there's stagnant water sitting around for 14 days or so. And the water sits around in plastic bags and in rubbish and in drains and anywhere you can find. And thank goodness you and your gang have at least led a clean-up campaign so you would think that would be helping anything that gets rid of stagnant water. But those little mosquitoes don't stop, Nick. They keep at it, and they keep breeding, and they love human beings. Now, the sad thing, since I was here last, Nick, would you believe, that 323 people in the three months of this year have got dengue fever, and one death, six times more than last year, Nick. So I hope your campaign's working because you're going to have to work a lot harder if we're going to reduce that statistic. We, we are indeed. We, we have seen some, some great results in uh, roadside cleaning in particular. I think everybody agrees that the island is looking much better uh, than it was last year. Uh, but there is a great deal of work to do. And I was asked actually here on the show about uh, three weeks ago about dengue fever and how the statistics were. And I hadn't seen these recent ones, but my gut feeling and my hope was that with cleaner roadsides, in fact, our dengue problem would actually be more under control. So these numbers to me are, I must say, quite shocking and, and appalling and, of course, very sad that we've had already one death from dengue fever. And, and as you rightfully say, they're very difficult. They're very hard to control. And even with a full awareness campaign such as the government is doing, and on tonight's show, this afternoon's show, we will be talking about what the government is doing. Um, and we will be hearing more on that subject in a minute. But, Peter, yeah, very bad news. Well, the good thing is that the government is worried about the program and is tackling it through this 333 campaign. And we just have to say, well done and keep at it. And we commend them for being so interested in this particular issue. It's a very big public health issue because the reality of us, 93.6 people per 100,000 inhabitants in Phuket are getting dengue fever. That's a lot, a lot of people and a lot of health that has to be tackled. So this campaign is extremely important. But I would argue that health workers and people in hospitals and the government and the local officials can't do it by themselves, Nick. It needs a wide public campaign, which is what the government is trying to do. And of course, I'm an educator. And last time I came onto this program, I was promoting the idea of working with the health department and the schools in establishing a, an education program where every single student on this island, the whole 27,000 people who go to some of, the, some of the bigger schools, are aware of the issues of dengue fever. But more importantly, what causes it? And at the end, it's all to do with water and waste management. So every student, every school, every community, every family has got to be aware of the issues of water and waste. And if it's lying around for over 14 days, somewhere around your place, you could get dengue fever because of the mosquito. There we are. Stay tuned. We're going to have more on that uh, topic from Peter uh, in, uh, in a few moments. And uh, on uh, today's show, which is going green, show number 72, uh, we'll also be looking at some of the international news uh, around uh, around the traps, a couple of new videos on our on our uh, website. You can go to myseek.org, click over to the radio show, and uh, uh, this afternoon we loaded up uh, three videos which were uh, particularly good 
Uh, one from Al Jazeera uh, was the history of oil. Uh, it's about a two-hour, four-part series. Uh, you can link that on. You can see that on the uh, the website. Uh, and there's also a uh, a new uh, video from the WWF on turtle conservation in Queensland. Uh, some sh saddening news: 1,500 turtles a year being washed up on their beaches, and uh, they ha are having all sorts of problems with turtle deaths, and a lot of it not being reasoned and they're not finding out what it is some some problems there in queensland but otherwise uh, we cleaned the beach this morning uh, on uh, kamala beach with the team from uh, kamala beach estate thank you uh, one of the volunteers uh, locally and uh, also uh, mariko from kamala beach estate so it's a good group we got about 12 bags of trash between 9 and 10 a.m and that southern end of the beach looking much better most of the trash we picked up today was plastic bags still uh, and of course that area uh, prolific in that a lot of the flow from the clong comes around the corner of the beach and then dumps it as the tide goes out. So that's a particularly bad place and is currently being cleaned every 10 days on schedule through to the end of this year uh, by the Kamala Green Club. So hats off to those guys for now nailing a cleaning schedule that goes right through till November, um, effectively every 10 days in almost every area along Kamala Beach. And you can go to the Kamala Green Club on Facebook, take a look at that schedule, join in, and uh, do be part of, of other green groups around Phuket that are helping to keep our beaches clean. So stay tuned. Coming back with more in a minute from Peter Harris and Nick Anthony. With the issues that matter to the island, the environment, and the planet, this is Going Green with Nick Anthony on Live 89.5. We're in the studio uh, this afternoon with uh, Peter Harris. Peter is uh, running a group called APEN, the Asia Pacific Environmental Network. He's based in Darwin, second time we've had Peter on the show, and uh, Peter is an educator, has been involved in working with all sorts of NGOs, he's been a headmaster, um, he's worked with some of the best sustainability minds in, uh, in Australia, and we've been very fortunate to have Peter uh, on Phuket over the last year a number of times, helping to advise SEEK, a local NGO, and also helping to advise the education minister here in Thailand, as well as the health, uh, deputy health minister here on Phuket. Um, one of those topics we've been talking about it has been dengue fever for the last actually three or four years, particularly with the health minister uh, going back to our original campaign to limit plastic bags and try to reduce waste. And it's very encouraging to see the level of support we're now getting across the island for clean beaches, for less plastic, less straws, all that type of thing. Um, however, as the numbers have shown us, uh, there are in fact statistics are much higher. The number of cases are much higher year on year. And already this year, we've had one death. Well, the Phuket News every week is uh, a great day newspaper. It comes out on Friday afternoon. And uh, every week, we do look at the Phuket newspaper with respect to a program called The Compass. Now, before I get to that, let's just backtrack a little bit. Right now, Phuket's high season has waned, and our winds are now coming from the west. With these westerlies, brings a lot of ocean trash to our beaches. And our island, over the last three or four weeks, is starting to look like a litter dump again. We are in a trash crisis every year from May until November with these winds coming through. Um, and it requires a lot of support and a lot of effort to keep cleaning these beaches. We've been working on something called the Phuket Green Island Campaign with the local governor over the last four years. And the ideals have been one of a sustainable, low-carbon island. And uh, we're, we're very pleased to report over the last couple of weeks a big increase in the number of recycling facilities on the island as sponsored by the government, a reduce and a reuse campaign, and uh, in places like Kamala Beach, uh, where we did do a beach clean this morning, uh, they have now got a, a, a program with a local orbitor that's just put in full recycling facilities in five locations around Kamala Beach. So kudos again there to uh, the Kamala Green Club. You can find them on Facebook and you can join their beach cleaning. Well, we've been working with something called a group called the Atkinson Group, and they use a model called Compass, and that's for planning a sustainable future. They use something called indicators or programs, and they fall under the four corners of the compass. N is for nature, E is for economy, South or S is for society, and West or W is for well-being. And uh, in this week's edition of the Phuket News, we'll start by looking at well-being issues, and of course this issue is dengue fever. Now, Peter, you mentioned before that the numbers of, of uh, reported cases are up four times year on year. And there has now been an announcement of a government campaign in order to try to tackle dengue fever and to reduce 
dengue by a number of measures. Um, what's the government doing with this 333 campaign? Nick, before we go straight into that, I was just reading an article. A nine-year-old boy died of dengue fever. A nine-year-old boy is somebody's son. Somebody belongs to that boy, the family. That boy goes to a school with as many members of the community. We cannot as a community just allow our young people, age nine, simply die because we have not taken enough action to manage our water so that malaria can take place. So the governor's response is correct, the 333 campaign. But at the end of the day, government officials can do all sorts of things. Policies can be put in place. But it's for you and I and families and school communities to act day by day to make sure that water is not lying around. Now, it's very easy to think that mosquitoes breed in all the streams and the creeks and the waters and the byways, but that's not the case. The water lies around in plastic bags and containers and tanks and things that we allow to sit. Now, I worked for a little time in Queensland in the north, and one of the more recent outbreaks of dengue fever started in a school, a school, Nick, where that's supposed to be safe and free and healthy and vibrant places. And that dengue fever spread immediately into other families throughout that community and spread very, very quickly. So I'm arguing the governor's campaign has got to now be directed by people like you and I, teachers in the schools, but parents and families who are going to be concerned. As I said, it's not the rivers and the swamps and the mangroves, but what we have to do is to get rid of the breeding sites. And what are they? You look around at your place, or at my place, or at the school place, could be in a bucket, an old tyre, pot plant of all places, vases sitting around too long, and of course around Phuket, large pools of water after it's been rain, raining can sit around houses and shops in the main street for, week, for weeks. Tin cans, plastic containers, gutters, fallen palm fronds fall down, hydroponic gardens even, you've seen them, and all striking like containers to grow plant, um, uh, what I mean is for plant containers, coconut shells, and of course plastic. Now I think you've done a wonderful job in trying to get rid of plastic, and I have to admit that going down to Patong Beach is much more of a pleasure now than it used to be a few years ago when I, when I first came. Very good news. So... At the school level, which is what I probably know better, we need to make sure that we've drained all the sump pits, because these are quite big um, mosquito dry, uh, areas, because they hold uh, lots of water. Um, we lower it down and put in concrete and sand and do all that, and we get rid of all the debris, and even put mesh sort of over the, over the, over the top of them all. So there's all these sorts of things that we can do in schools. It's the drains, so to go back to this campaign, the governor is absolutely correct to focus on it, but he can't do it alone and neither can the officials. So it's mum and dad, aunties and uncles, brothers and sisters saying, no, no, that could give us dengue fever. And it's for school leaders, principals, teachers, students who are echo leaders to say, there's water lying there and we don't want it because one of our students could die because of it. Indeed, indeed. It takes a big task, uh, but the campaign seems to have started off on the right foot and, and at the right time, of course. So 
uh, wetter part of the year is just starting. It's a time when we all have to be more vigilant. And there are more mosquitoes and you do have to be more careful. So when you are on about, particularly in mid-afternoon, late afternoon, make sure you've got some bug spray on because they'll, uh, they'll start biting quite early these days. Well, the good thing about the governor, it said he's got three, three, three. So the last three is for three months. This is the three months that's going to be very, very important. It'll be the most critical. We start now. Sounds good. There you go. You heard it. Peter Harris talking about dengue fever. Uh, you can read about that on uh, on the Puget News website or pick up a copy of the Puget News. And uh, it's in that and available all around the island. This is Nick Anthony and uh, you're on Going Green. Uh, show number 72. Nick Anthony, caring about your island home. This is Going Green on Live 89.5. And welcome back to the Going Green show number 72. I've got Peter Harris in the studio with me, and we've been talking about sustainability, talking about dengue fever, and uh, we've been looking a little bit at uh, this weekend's edition of the Phuket News. Now, Peter, uh, last time you were here on Phuket uh, at the end of last year, uh, you were hosting a, uh, uh, a, a workshop at the Princess Mother School uh, regarding sustainability education, environmental education, and the intro- introduction of a uh, environmental program into initially Phuket schools with a, a view of perhaps having a wider uh, uh, ability to put this into more Thai schools. How was your progress following that meeting? Slowly, Nick, but it was a very important occasion. There were 27 schools, 300 students, all from the south of Thailand, Most of the students were learning English, and this was strongly supported by the Federal Directorate of Education, certainly the local governor, and very ably led by the director and staff of the Princess Mother School. This was in association with ASEAN Week. Now, what I've discovered is that Thailand is very much a proud founding member of ASEAN. And these 300 students spend a day and a half talking about the different countries of ASEAN, and particularly the first 11. So we all learnt a bit about them. And at the end of the day, we all sang, you would be pleased to know, Nick, Heal the World with Michael Jackson. And even I can now sing that. And I've got it on YouTube if you really want to listen to thank it. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Heal the World. We all sang it. And we started to think about how are the issues of this Phuket Island, the compass points that you talked about. Yes. And there was a most fantastic report done by the students. And I don't know what you adults think you're doing, but I'm very clear that the students of the Phuket schools know exactly what they want for the environment And I don't know why we're just stuffing around sometimes when it's very clear they've got very strong views about the population and the growth and the need to protect the island. But the good thing that came out of it was they said, well, we are in Thailand and we want to share this with other ASEAN countries. Now, that's magic. Magic. One of the countries that we were going to share it with or which we intend to share it with is the Philippines. And there is an island in the Philippines. 20 years ago, pristine, seven kilometres long, beautiful, mainly looked after by the indigenous people with fishing and the occasional person, probably like you, Nick, as a backpacker, thinking that they have found their paradise. I did. I I discovered it in 1992, Barakai, and I've been there probably a dozen or 15 times over the years. Well, you wouldn't be going there now to find it because there's now one million tourists go to Boracay every year. One million. It's amazing. It's 10% of Phuket. 10% of Phuket. And, of course, they now have direct flights from Taiwan, Shanghai and Malaysia. Almost right. Fortunately, you can't quite get onto the island without going by boat, although it was promoted that they would build a tunnel under the waterway, which has, you know, huge waves going across it. And fortunately, that was stopped. But this island, which is just two kilometres um, off the tip west of, I think it's called Panay, or Panay mm-hmm. Island, mm-hmm. Uh, and it has had many, many awards for its wonderful white and pristine beaches. And there's two sides of the island, and as, and as you know, the winds go in one direction and then in the other direction. 
Well, it's all very well going to the pristine side of it, but if you go to the other side of the island, of Bulabog, where there's a nice long pipe, well, in fact, it isn't a nice long pipe. It should be a nice long pipe. It's no more than about 20 metres long. And it takes really a lot of the excess water from the sewerage treatment plant. Now, water going into the sea from the sewerage treatment plant, which isn't fully treated, is not terribly good for the water. And it's certainly not terribly good for the fish. And it's not terribly good for the people who are swimming or kite flying around it. So this island, which you went to as a backpacker, is now suffering from huge tourist development, one million a year, without the infrastructure support to back it. Sewerage was the big issue. Now, there is no question that the government has, in fact, put in sewerage treatment plants. They're only five or six years old. But sewerage is treated in two or three different ways. The basic way, there's some that gets it clean enough so you can drink. But the third layer still leaves all the nutrients and everything in it. And it's that which goes into the coral and in the end destroys the coral. So, Nick, the reason for going to Boracay for a lot of people, apart from the pristine beaches, is to see the coral. Well, there won't be any coral left in the future unless this issue is addressed. But just as importantly, for those one million tourists, they have to be looked after. Now, there's some big hotels, like the Shangri-La Hotel, which I personally visited, who have gone out of their way to make sure that that hotel is totally sustainable. It's very impressive. Um, they use solar energy, not for everything. They collect their water. They haven't destroyed any of the plants. They house their local um, workers. And it's a really good model of a large scale hotel development. But then you go to the next layer where people are more concerned about managing costs, getting labour across from another island, where can they house them almost in the cheapest way, and there's not quite the same level of concern about what's going to happen. I believe this is a very serious issue. The government clearly is interested in it, the Boracay Education and Development Fund is interested in it. The Boracay Chamber of Commerce is interested in it. And it's like it was here in Phuket two years ago. The time has come. The, really, the time has come to address the issue of Boracay, not just for the people who live in Boracay and the indigenous people who were there and everybody else, but for the planet. It's a classic case of a small island community overdeveloped in a non-sustainable way. And if we, if we don't do something, the next generation won't be having it. That's right. There'll be nothing there for them. Well, uh, uh, Peter is uh, going to be back after the break and we'll talk a little bit about some of the, the solutions that he's going to be presenting to Boracay and some ideas and roadmap uh, following on from the work that's been done here in Phuket with SEEK. And uh, we'll discuss a little bit the next plan of meetings and strategies and how they're going to incorporate some of these Phuket programs into hopefully making Barakai a better place. Stay tuned. This is Nick Anthony and Peter Harris. And we're on the Going Green, show number 72. Of Going Green with Nick Anthony on Live 89.5. And you are back live here in the studio in Phuket Town with Nick Anthony and Peter Harris. We've just been talking about uh, Boracay and some of the problems that that small island is getting with now over a million tourists per year. It's about 10% of Phuket and, of course, a very small island, mostly sand, very low-lying, and has all sorts of problems, particularly with sewerage, bad water, uh, green algae, and uh, the result is now starting to impact tourism in a reduction of, uh, of number of tourists, and they're going to get some problems in the future if it's not tackled now. Well, Peter's 
been looking at this issue very closely. He just came back from a trip to Boracay. And uh, Peter, what are they? What, what, what are you going to do over there? Who you, how are you going to strategize to give these guys the roadmap that we've very fortunately had here in Phuket for the last year and a half? The important thing for me is to acknowledge that Boracay belongs to the community of Boracay and the Filipino people. But also as a nation, it's part of ASEAN and it's part of the world. I live in Darwin. We have our own issues. I work on a little place called Groot Island, which is an Aboriginal community, which is probably going underwater in a few years' time because it's at sea level. But I tend to look at the world globally from that spot and say, we in Darwin, we here in Phuket, we in Boracay are facing similar sorts of issues on sustainability. So for me it's going there and, and working as partners, as partners together to do something about this world, as Michael Jackson said, to heal this world, our planet, for our people and for me as an educator, for the next generation and for your grandkids and the children after that, Nick. So they've actually got something to, in, to enjoy. So when we go to an island, it's not for me to tell them anything. In fact, I have probably more to learn, more to learn, because a singer at the hotel was singing good old Michael Jackson's Heal the World to me. And I said, what can I do? What can I do? as an educator to help this island. And he said to me, Nick, just stop talking and start listening. And I thought, that's the first thing I've got to do, is to listen to the different communities of interest. Now, Boracay was in fact managed and owned by the traditional owners. And there's some very significant issues there at the moment on social justice, about housing, health, education with the traditional owners. There's long government interest in terms of giving economic future for the people of those communities. There's strong commercial interests with the hotels. And there are strong lots of people who are looking for jobs to find an answer. So there's not one group of people. It's a matter of how we, can we pull together using the compass model so that every community group feels as though it's part and parcel of the answer. So what am I doing? Well, I'm afraid I have to ignore a little bit my singer with Heal the World, because I might have to do a little bit of talking so I can do a little bit more listening. So the thing would be to see all the stakeholders first. And then we'll hold a meeting like you did at Phuket, the key people, the key decision makers. So you've got the government, education, health, the big hotels, the small hotels, some of the workers and the indigenous community coming to listen to what sort of strategy we can put together. Now I mentioned in the last section how first rate was the statement that was prepared by the students in the compass. Honestly, it was the most wonderful roadmap for this island and if we can get a roadmap like that developed over the next one or two years, which is owned by every single person in that community, then I think we've done something. And we're doing it not to impose, we're doing it as like an ASEAN partner together. So I'm going over, thanks to all the experience here, show that community what we've done, because it's just a microcosm of Phuket really, just a smaller version, and there's lots of little island communities, a smaller version to see is there anything that we can do? Everything from beach cleanups to um, you know green clubs and all the other. We'll put all that together and then we'll hide a, hold a wider meeting and then the important thing is to make sure that the government takes it on. Now the thing that I've been really encouraged to see it on the front page of the, of the Phuket newspaper that the government is so interested in the environment because its impact that it's the lead story and a lead policy. Now, that's what we'll be looking for, of course, in Boracay, Nick. So it'll take a little bit of time, a little bit of talking. So it's much the same sort of process as we've had here. 
and I'm going to value the support of the community here of SEEK and the Atkinson Group and uh, the, um, you know, the International Union for Conservation, all those community groups to back it because to save another island is a way of saving the whole planet, I guess. That's right. It's also a nice transfer of information into an area that perhaps hasn't had that level of, of roadmap and that level of inclusivity of the community, which we certainly found in the process over the last year and a half in putting together the Phuket Sustainability Plan, which I might add is getting quite close. The indicators have all been confirmed. Uh, the document is currently being created. Um, I've seen some drafts and it's looking very smart and the advice and the, the suggestions are uh, looking uh, very manageable. Uh, so I hope uh, Barakai can, can enjoy some of those benefits and it does help to give people a clearer picture of what could happen in the future if, for example, they don't do anything. Yeah. And uh, it's working in a collaborative way, respecting their position in, in, on the island and their position within the community and uh, doing it in a, in a culturally sensitive way. And pollution, I know, in, uh, in Barakai is both politically and culturally sensitive. Uh, even when I was there, going back to now 1996, they already had green algae coming up and it was already starting to impact the island and they did actually then stop the key pollution being pumped out on that western beach, on the most beautiful beach, but it seems now they've pumped it just to the other side of the island. Well, Nick, last time I was in Phuket, I did a detox class. Now, this is one of the most powerful experiences that you should have, ever have. But if you ever want to lose a bit of weight, you go and have a detox program. But I also did a lot of yoga. And I really like to thank the Admanji people and all the team down there because that was really first rate. And I lost five kilos. But I went, when I went to Boracay, I thought I'd get up at eight o'clock in the morning to do yoga. The pristine beaches at eight o'clock in the morning aren't pristine. There's green algae right along the edge of the water. It's not in the pictures, but if you do go to the 7.30 yoga class and you want to swim, that's what you've got to go through. You'll see your algae. Well, here on Phuket, you've seen the Phuket News the last couple of weeks. They've been talking about the Klongs, particularly in Bangtao and Phuket Town, and there is, for the first time, real action in trying to clean up those Klongs, and we're hopeful that uh, that program here on our own island um, will work to to create a nice natural environment in all of our clongs, ensuring that there is no wastewater heading out into the Andaman Sea. All right, Nick. Um, uh, thanks very much for having me. Thank by you, the way. Peter, for joining us. And uh, just to finish, to thank the people of Phuket, I was down at Woolies in the Woolies shop in Darwin, standing in a queue, and uh, I chatted to the people next door, and they said. Where have you been? And I said, I've been to Phuket and we've been working on saving the environment and the sustainability and, and all of that. And the man had a great big T-shirt on it. And he said, I love Lombok. And I said, do you love Lombok? He said, I love Lombok. And he said, will, will see, come over and help save Lombok from all the issues of Phuket. And I thought, my trip's ready for the future, you know, because... Here I come to Phuket and I think it's wonderful. I'm going to save um, Boracay from sewerage and I've got Lombok. This is all because I've stood in a Woolies queue and I might add in Darwin they don't sell plastic bags. Okay, that's good, that's good no news. plastic bags in Woolies in Darwin. You'll be very pleased very to good. hear. Very pleased to hear. A Lombok. And then finally I said, I'm going to Indonesia because I'm very happy because in education I really like all the sorts of issues to do with social justice. And believe it or not, I am going to visit a training college in Yogyakarta. And guess what it is? It's a transgender training school run by the Islamic community for transgender people who want to be better Muslims. Wow. Well, how's that? Hey, kid. I know. So when I come back to Phuket, I'll have something really to tell. That will be a first. <laughs> you heard it here first. In fact, that was Peter Harris. Peter, again, thanks very much for joining us. Pleasure, as always.